All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. If you are able to see me right now and our panel here, uh, you are part of our California High Speed Rail Authority Burbank to Los Angeles Project Section Open House. Good evening. Thank you so much for taking a moment in your busy day these days to join us um, to learn a little bit more information about the Burbank to Los Angeles Project Section Draft Environmental Impact Report and Draft Environmental Impact Statement. Um, my name is Henoveva Arellano. I am a member of the outreach team for the authority who has been working with you over the years to communicate the information on this very important planning project. Um, our objective here today is to share the information with you about the release of the environmental document and a lot more information as it relates to the project. Um, what I'd like to do is ask our panel members who you can see on the screen here to introduce themselves. They will be um, providing you the information throughout today's presentation and available to you uh, to answer your questions during our question and answer period. After their introductions, I'll go through some information just so that you'll know how our meeting will be navigated completely in a virtual environment, but plenty of information for you to glean about this very important project. All right, so before I do that, I would very much like our panelists and uh, presenters to introduce themselves. So I'll start with Bruce. Bruce, if you can introduce yourself, please. I'm Bruce Armstead, Director of Operations and Maintenance for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Excellent. Uh, next in our presentation, we'll have Diane. Diane? Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Ricard, and I'm the Project Manager for High Speed Rail for the Burbank to Los Angeles Project section. Awesome. Da after Diane's presentation, we'll be introducing Rob. Rob, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob McCann. I'm with the High Speed Rail Authority's environmental team. Awesome. And then in addition, we'll be following our presentation with a question and answer period. Mm -hmm. um, all three of our presenters will be available to you uh, to answer your questions. In addition to uh, two additional project team members, Tyler, if you can introduce yourself. Hi everybody, Tyler Bonstead. I am the project manager with the consultant team uh, for the design and the environmental process. Excellent. Uh, and in joining the team is Jennifer, Jennifer Jones, if you can introduce yourself. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Jones and I am a member of the land acquisition team. Excellent. Uh, so together, this team is here today. We are so happy to be with you to present information again about the Burbank to Los Angeles project section of the California High Speed Rail Program. Um, as you all know, uh, we are in a virtual environment these days when it comes to public information. Um, but we are very grateful to have this technology to take the, mo the time and the moment that we need to walk you through the information. Um, I believe, as you know, many of you have joined us before in our open house meetings. Um, these, this environmental planning of the project for the entire Southern California section actually has been going on for some time. Um, in spite of our virtual restrictions right now, um, the outreach continues and it's an extremely important period for us to share with you this information. Um, in the past, um, many of you know, our open house meetings have been held in person um, in multiple locations along the corridor. Um, we, would we would go into a large meeting room, we would prevent, uh, present different project information by station, and then we would walk the whole audience through a, a presentation to, from beginning to end, walk you through the information. Um, while we are not able to be in person today, we will still be accomplishing the same information, but just in a little bit of a different way, and I'll walk you through that. So tonight, we are scheduled to be online with you until 7.30. Um, so we have plenty of time to walk you through the information. Um, we will be uh, doing a main presentation, as I mentioned. Following the presentation, I'll be taking a few moments to um, navigate our new project website, which essentially puts the entire open house meeting online for you. Um, I'll show you how to navigate it and all of the information that you will receiving during our presentation today is available to you on the online website. So you'll be able to navigate that on your own even beyond today's meeting. Um, and then we'll allow time for your questions and answers. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how you raise your hand in order to do that. 
as I mentioned, we were, are scheduled to be online uh, until 7.30 this evening. Uh, please know that today's meeting is being recorded and very important, we'll be repeating this a few times. Your comments or your questions that you uh, provide to us, whether it's through um, uh, raising your hand and verbally asking this question or anything that you put in the chat function, um, it is not part of the official public record as, as a comment from you on the project. Today's open house meeting is meant to be informational, make the team available to you directly to ask questions about the document, um, anything else of concern or information that you would need to know to help you to further inform you to comment on the environmental document. We'll be reviewing the dates, where to find the information, so you'll be able to do that completely um, after uh, our today, today's session. Um, we should also let you know that today's open house meeting um, is being repeated today completely in Spanish by our Spanish-speaking team. That presentation begins via a separate Zoom link at 6.30 p.m., which has been publicly noticed. Um, and our Spanish speaking team will be essentially repeating the same presentation that our panel here today is presenting to you. Um, for that session, uh, we will be having a separate, uh, as I mentioned, a separate meeting link and a separate phone line for people to call in. However, um, if you are listening to this presentation now and would like to listen to it in Spanish, uh, we also have simultaneous translation of this presentation in English. Um, it will, what we are asking you to do is to call a separate phone line, and we'll also include this on the chat function if you're interested. That phone number for the separate Spanish translation of this presentation that is occurring right now, that phone number is 669-999-0243. Again, that's 669-999-0243. So I'm going to repeat this information in Spanish if you'll just give me one moment for those who are Spanish speaking. Para su información, esta reunión se va a repetir completamente en español a las seis y media a través de un link distinto y con nuestro equipo de habla español. Si usted gustaría escuchar esta presentación en este momento en español, también es posible. Usted tiene que llamar un número separado y este, ese número es... 669-999-0243. Otra vez, 669-999-0243. Vamos a incluir este número de teléfono también en el chat de esta presentación. Okay. So now what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of context, a little bit of background as to why this today's open house meeting is important and how it sits in relation to the overall planning of the whole California high-speed rail program here in California. Um, in 2005, um, the state of California passed, adopted a program environmental document which uh, officially launched um, the planning of the statewide uh, environmental, excuse me, the statewide uh, high-speed rail system. Um, in 2008, um, the voters of California passed Proposition 1A, which authorized the state to do funding for the program and later introduce federal funding. 2014, this section um, completed its public scoping. At the same time, that section also separated itself from the Palmdale to Los Angeles section. So the Burbank to LA section actually was part of the Palmdale to Los Angeles section um, as part of the overall program environmental document. And in 2014, it became its own section. So today, um, since 2014, the team has been doing its alternatives analysis and, and a couple of weeks ago, specifically on Friday, May 29th, actually released the draft environmental impact report, draft environmental impact statement, um, to officially receive public comment on this project section. As you can see, it's been a long time coming, and um, that's why today's open house meeting is important for you to receive that information about that project, this project, and uh, for you to understand how um, it's been in development for quite a number of years. Just to review a few dates with you, Friday, May 29th again is when officially the document was released and when the 45-day public comment period was commenced. I would like to announce to you today that just recently 
that public comment period has been extended to an additional 15 days. Um, so now, uh, instead of July 16th, um, when the comment period ended, uh, we are now officially communicating that it has been extended 15 additional days to Friday, July 31st. So that's a very easy date to remember. It's a Friday, last day of the month. That is now the end of the public comment period for the B to LA section um, environmental document. It's a 60 day comment period. So you have plenty of time to review the document, absorb the information today and provide us your, uh, your comment uh, or question on the project. Um, just to review very quickly, um, this, this same presentation was shared with our legislative offices um, prior to today's open house to make sure our elected representatives are fully informed about the project. Um, this has been the practice of the authority to make sure our elected offices have always been briefed prior to the authority releasing public information. So we are very grateful to them for always having that, that relationship with the authority. We also conducted a stakeholder working group meeting last week, which is the leadership of the community um, that has been engaged with us. Many of you have participated in that SWG stakeholder working group meeting, and we are grateful to, to the community leaders who help also receive the same information and disseminate that to the community. So today's open house meeting has been fully publicly noticed. It's open to the entire public. Um, this meeting um, is being broadcast obviously publicly to anyone who can dial in and we provide multiple ways for people to participate. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, or actually I haven't mentioned yet, but next week, Wednesday, not next week, in two weeks, Wednesday, July 8th, will be the official public hearing to receive your comments on the document. Now, we will be reviewing with you multiple ways for you to provide your public comments, formal public comments. The public hearing is one way, um, and we will be repeating a Zoom virtual meeting much like tonight, but in a much more formal sense for people to uh, record um, their public comment on the document. We will be repeating the state, but again, that date is Wednesday, July 8th. Uh, from 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. It will be a virtual meeting completely. Normally, we would hold those meetings in person uh, for the same amount of time. This time, we will be doing it online. I would also like to announce that on uh, next week, on June 29th, excuse me, it's actually in a week and a half, got to get my date straight here. Uh, Monday, June 29th, just added to the schedule, we will be doing a telephone town hall um, on this project. So this, will, this is a different meeting format where on a phone line, you all can call in and engage with the team with questions and answers on the project. You will be receiving more information about this. This is also noticed um, on the public website. Um, that will be, if you wanna mark your date, uh, mark your calendar, that date again is Monday, June 29th, and that will be in the evening from six to 7 p.m. There's a separate phone number that you call. I'll uh, go ahead and say it now, but it will be repeated over and over um, before we, we get off um, the session today. That phone number for the telephone town hall meeting on Monday, June 29th is 855-840. 6970. Again, that's 855-840-6970. Um, you'll receive more information about that that was just added to the program, so um, please know that that information is coming to you now. Just make sure I can get down on my screen here. Okay. Um, so again, as I mentioned, the open house meeting today is specifically designed to to give you full project information um, about the program, specifically about the Burbank to LA section and the specifics surrounding the environmental documents and the process that we have used to get to this point. All of the information presented during our open house meeting today is completely available to you online. I will review the website, as I mentioned with you, following our presentation and how to find the documents, an interactive map and much more. Okay, so now what I would like to do is review with you how we are gonna conduct our virtual open house. It's very simple. And many of you I know have participated in Zoom meetings before, but I'll explain uh, just for the benefit of the entire group. Uh, right now you can see the entire team uh, via, uh, or you should be able to see this via our camera to start the meeting. 
Um, we will be turning our cameras off when, you will, when we start the presentation. So the PowerPoint presentation that you see on the screen now will be all that you see as our panelists uh, walk you through the information. We will turn the cameras back on during our question and answer period so that you can see who is answering your question and actually dialogue with that individual. Uh, we will be taking your questions after the presentation in a couple of ways. Um, we ask you online through your Zoom platform to raise your hand, which is a button that you should find at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any problem, just also use the chat function to ask us questions about how to navigate your screen. We will call upon you, I will call upon you um, in order of receiving your question, and I will ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself and verbally ask your question to the panelists. And our team will um, take up your question as to whoever is the right person to answer it. Um, what I would like to do is ask, um, obviously, for you to ask one question at a time and allow the panelists to answer it. Please be respectful. I do need to ask you all to not use any threatening language, profanity, or any other inappropriate language. Um, this will not be permitted or tolerated during our public session, and any disruptive participants um, will be removed from the webinar. I don't expect that that will happen, um, but I do need to mention that, that those are our rules in conducting a, a productive public session. If you have any technical problem with your connection, please send us a message via the chat function on the webinar. You can also um, go to our meet hsrsocal.org website. If you just Google that, meet hsrsocal.org, there is a support uh, email there. You can also talk to us that way. Um, secondly, another way that you can ask a question during our session is by telephone. Some of you are maybe only listening to us by phone for whatever reason, not through an internet connection, which is totally fine. On your phone keypad, if for you to raise your hand and participate or ask a question, um, we will need you to push star nine or asterisk nine on your keypad, and that will uh, show up on our system here and we know that you'll be asking a question. I will then identify you very likely by your phone number, the last four digits of your phone number, but one way or another we'll make sure we'll get to your question. Same thing in order of um, receiving that here on our system. Um, you can use the chat function. Many of you are accustomed to using chat. I would um, ask you to just use the chat function to ask us questions or to get information about how to navigate the system. Um, I would prefer you to raise your hand for our verbal questions. And there's a lot of back and forth that our staff will definitely use with you on the chat. Um, and some of your easy questions can be answered there. Um, but if you have a question of the panelists, if you can please use the raise your hand function, that's the best way to get it across. One way or another, we're checking all of our systems here in the, in the room, and we'll be sure to answer your questions and get to your comments as best we can. Again, I need to repeat, uh, your comments or questions as part of this meeting are not official public comments as part of the record. This Today's open house meeting is uh, informational only, and hopefully we will be getting a lot of information today to uh, help you understand and comment on this uh, very important project. All right, enough of all that. Hopefully you all are ready to go. And with that, um, I would like to introduce our lead speaker, um, Bruce Armistead. Again, he's Director of Maintenance and Operations for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Bruce, take it away. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, connecting California. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for this evening, Connecting California's High-Speed Rail Program. I'm going to give an, an overview of the California High-Speed Rail Program, and Diane is going to talk about Los Angeles to, I mean, Burbank to Los Angeles project section. Uh, Rob will take care of the environmental next steps, and then we'll walk through stakeholder engagement and how to stay involved. Next slide, please. The California High Speed Rail Project is intended to increase mobility. It's a needed alternative to freeway lanes and airport gates. It will result in better air quality and job growth. Next slide, please. Uh, a new vision, increased access to jobs and housing. The High Speed Rail Pro Project is part of an integrated multi-tiered rail network 
We'll be working together to multiply benefits. We'll explore broader mobility and corridor improvements. It's a plan for a sustainable future. We'll focus on bringing better, faster, and more frequent connections throughout the state and beyond. And our path forward is to incorporate the state rail plan goals and objectives. What you, the map to your left, I'm sorry. Did you oh, go back? I wanted to. Sorry about that. That's all right. The map to your left shows uh, rail services above 100, 125 miles an hour in the light green, rail services up to 125 miles an hour in the light blue, existing bus and transit rail transit network is shown in orange, Amtrak long distance trains are shown in the black, and a ferry, the ferry boat services are shown with the dotted lines. Uh, next slide, please. Phase one of our program is 520 miles. It stretches from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Of that 520 miles, we have 119 miles under construction. Phase two of our program extends 300 miles. It connects Merced to Sacramento, and it connects Los Angeles to San Diego via the Inland Empire. It's to, we'll run trains at approximately 200 miles an hour and we will have up to 24 stations and our stations are shown with the white bullets on the map. Next slide, please. State investments in Southern California. The state is currently investing $4.4 .4 billion in funding uh, in Southern California. We've awarded to, we've awarded that 4.4 billion to passenger rail projects throughout so as SoCal over the past few years. Of that 4.4, 1.3 billion is from high-speed rail. And Cal the California High-Speed Rail Authority was instrumental in closing the funding gap for many significant regional projects, some of which have already been completed. The table to the right shows funding source, HSR Prop 1A connectivity being one of them, Prop 1A early investment funds, TIRCP, et cetera. And the totals to the right are shown, which add up to the 1.3 billion. Next slide, please. Southern California, some of the highlights of projects that make up the 1.3 billion are Link US, which is 441 million for that uh, Union Station's run-through project. We have shared corridor improvements to 363 million for high-speed rail, Metrolink, and LOSAN. We have uh, safety improvements, $77 million to the rosecrantz marquardt grade separation project. And we have connectivity projects, including 389 million from Prop 1A, for the regional connector project, we have Metrolink tier four locomotives, and we have the positive, positive train control project. Next slide, please. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Diane so she can go through the specifics of the Burbank to Los Angeles project section. Diane. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Again, hi everybody, thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Ricard, I'm the project manager for this section. The Burbank to Los Angeles high-speed rail section is approximately 14 miles in length. Uh, it begins at the Burbank Airport Station below ground and it ends at Los Angeles Union Station. We have two alternatives under study, the project alternative, which you see on the map, and the no project alternative. Uh, the benefits in, in include improving operational characteristics for passenger and freight services, improving safety, and reducing emissions and congestion because the train is electrified and it will get people out of their autos and airplanes and onto the train. Next slide, please. The, the, the corridor that we're going along is uh, mostly along the existing train corridor, which is shared by both Metrolink and uh, Amtrak and the UPRR. And along the shared corridor, some of the features will be positive train control, which restricts train speeds and serves as a fail-safe system and takes over the system preventing running red signals. Corridor project protection and detection, 
including fencing, walls, and sound barriers in different places. Great, great separations, which take vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians over or under active railroad tracks to prevent accidents and free up traffic flow by either raising the railroad tracks above the road or raising the road above the railroad tracks. There will be an early earthquake warning system which detects the initial seismic wave and immediately cuts off power to the trains. And we are, there will be planning around the station so that we're working with city, the cities on transit-oriented development. Next slide, please. So uh, both the Burbank Airport Station and Los Angeles Union Station are intermodal. They have different modes going into them. They're intermodal centers. Um, we will integrate with the existing facilities where available, uh, meaning the tracks and platforms, passenger amenities, uh, accommodations for vehicle and bicycle parking, and pick up and drop off for all transportation modes. Pedestrian access and safety is very important to us at these stations, as well as bicycle connectivity, direct rail and transit connections, and in the case of Burbank Airport Station, uh, access to the airport and uh, considerations for auto circulation. Next slide, please. So at, in, within the city of Burbank, the Burbank Airport Station provides a connection to Hollywood Burbank Airport and is in the vicinity of two Metrolink stations. The underground, there will be an underground alignment between the airport and Empire Center and it follows the existing railroad corridor at grade to the southern Burbank city limit. At Glendale and Atwater Village, our alignment follows the existing railroad corridor. We have been in coordination with local neighborhoods and uh, local cities on the grade separations. And this alignment avoids the historic Glendale Amtrak Metrolink station. In Los Angeles, the alignment crosses the Los Angeles River near State Route 110. The designs are sensitive to the Rio de Los Angeles State Park, the Los Angeles State Historic Park, and Albion Riverside Park. We have been in coordination with the Los Angeles River Path, the Taylor Yard River Park, and Metro's Link Us project. The Link Us project is designed to increase capacity for rail service at LA Union Station while reducing train idling times. It will also accommodate future high-speed rail service and expand the station's capacity. And LA Union Station is Southern California's largest multimodal transportation hub with links uh, between Metro's light rail and bus service, uh, local and regional bus service, Amtrak, um, and, and eventually high-speed rail. Next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about a grade separation. With a grade separation, it's a roadway that is realigned over or under the train tracks to eliminate hazards. High-speed rail proposes to, uh, high-speed rail is environmentally clearing some of the grade separation uh, grade separations for some of the existing roads. And benefits of grade separations include improving safety. So grade separations eliminate conf conflicts between trains and vehicles and pedestrians, increase train speeds by allowing trains to travel at a greater speed since they're separated from auto vehicle and pedestrian traffic. It improves the train's operation, rel operational reliability providing an opportunity for increased passenger rail service. Noise would be reduced because trains do not sound horns when crossing the intersection. It will decrease traffic congestion. Traffic can continue to flow when a train is crossing the intersection since it's, the vehicle traffic is separated from the train traffic. And it reduces greenhouse gas emissions since vehicles do not have to idle while waiting for an approaching train. The grade separations that are being environmentally cleared in this environmental analysis are within the city of Burbank, the Buena Vista Street, in the city of Glendale, Sonora Avenue, Grandview Avenue, and Flower Street, 
uh, within the city of Glendale and Los Angeles, Goodwin Avenue, which is Chevy Chase Drive, where but at, also at Chevy Chase Drive, where pedestrian bicycle crossing only, and it will be closed to vehicles, and Main Street in the city of Los Angeles. The document also includes a grade separation that Metro is currently working on right now at Sperry Street and Salem Street, which is on the border of Glendale and Atwater Village. Um, so I, I think I have one more slide and, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rob. So throughout this process, we have been doing quite a bit of outreach to outreach to members of the public and stakeholder working groups and, and also uh, elected officials. And uh, we've held community open houses and stakeholder working group series in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and in March of this year. And more than 850 community members collectively attended all of these uh, outreach events. We offered interpreter services for up to eight languages. The meetings have been bilingual and webcast, and we've had a, a presence on social media uh, to information share. More than 400 organizations were involved to our stakeholder working groups, and we've had ongoing community activities. So we hold meetings with key stakeholders and community organizations. We also attend their meetings. We've had information booths at various community events, um, multifaceted bilingual approach uh, focused on reaching all communities, and you can always comment 24-7 uh, online. So outreach and, and getting the word out has been very important to us. And with that, uh, Rob, if you would like to go through the next slides. Great, thank you, Diane. Um, so Bruce has provided you a great overview of the high-speed rail system, and Diane provided a lot of details about the Burbank to Los Angeles project section, the design and, and concept. I'll be sharing with you about the environmental document that's currently out for public review, what some of the information is that you can uh, find in there and how you can comment on it. This first slide shows the process uh, that we've, we've been through and where we're going and where we are today, which is during the public review and comment period. As Henneveva mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, there's been quite a bit of study and alternatives analysis going on on this project section dating back to 2009. Uh, with the studies that were prepared, we presented a preferred to the authority in October 18, and with their approval to identify our build alternative as the preferred alternative in the draft environmental document, we are now at the point where we are today, which is the public review period of that document. Um, I'll talk about the later steps of slide in the presentation. Next slide. So the environmental review process, just a couple highlights here. The High Speed Rail Authority is the state lead agency under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, but as a result of a memorandum of understanding executed with the Federal Railroad Administration last year, they have now also been assigned responsibilities as the lead federal agency under the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, overall, the, completing the environmental process is important because once we get to the approved environmental document and approval of the project, that opens up the ability to then advance uh, other funding opportunities for design and ultimately construction of the project. Next slide. So a little bit uh, just to share about the environmental process, uh, how we work uh, very closely with the project engineering team, where we First, identify what are critical resources within the community, within the natural environment, and working with the uh, engineering team looking for ways to avoid impacting those resources. But in a very constrained urban environment, it's very hard to avoid all impacts, so we look for opportunities where those impacts can be minimized, uh, perhaps a retaining wall to avoid encroachment onto a property or to a sensitive area. And then finally, where we do have impacts, we look we have a number of different strategies to mitigate those impacts where we can't avoid or minimize them. Next slide. Uh, some of the examples for uh, ways to uh, design considerations that have come into play 
over the past several years as far as the different alternatives evaluated. I've been to follow within the existing road or as much as possible uh, to add the new heist tracks within the existing rail corridor. Where we cross over uh, water crossings such as the LA River or, or other crossings, uh, doing that so in such a way so that we're not encroaching into that, the waterway. Um, and then also, as I said earlier, you know, looking wherever we can to avoid sensitive resources, whether it's part of the natural environment or part of the local community. So we conduct a number of technical studies. I will not read everything on this slide to you, but there are a number of uh, uh, studies that we conduct that address impacts on the human environment, whether it's the aesthetics and visual quality, uh, looking at community impacts, uh, with the natural environment, we uh, conduct studies, uh, biological resource studies, hydrology and water studies. Uh, there's a whole host of these and all these technical studies are prepared and then this information uh, is, is fed into the draft environmental document, which I'll talk about in a moment. Next slide. So the content of the environmental document, again, I promise not to read everything on this slide to you, uh, but this is uh, the overall structure of the draft environmental impact report, environmental impact statement. There is a, uh, uh, for those of you that may be looking at an environmental document for the first time, or any, you know, <laughs> even if you've uh, looking at your hundredth environmental document, a good place to start is always reviewing the summary. Uh, the summary provides a, a overview of the project, the development of alternatives, the uh, a summary of each of those environmental topics I talked about and what some of the key issues are and what some of the key mitigation measures are, and then also talking about the next steps forward after the draft environmental process. Uh, chapter one is the purpose and need statement explaining what the, the purpose of the project is. The uh, alternatives uh, describes the alternatives being evaluated. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, covers the alternatives that were studied previously. So it provides a good background for you on that. The affected environment, environmental consequences and mitigation measures section, that is the, uh, the one that is the most um, robust part of the document. That's the real heart of the document where we go through each of those environmental topics, uh, describe what's out there today, what the impacts and benefits are, and then also describes the mitigation measures. We have a chapter on section 4F, which is a special uh, for federal requirements where we address impacts to public recreation resources, as well as historic properties. And then also a separate chapter on environmental justice, where we address uh, where any locations where the project might have a disproportionately high and adverse impact on environmental justice populations, which includes minorities and low income populations. Uh, Several other uh, uh, chapters there talks about the project cost. There's information on the project cost in the document and our chapter on the preferred alternative describes the basis for how the, uh, the, the decision making that went into or the rationale and the basis for identifying the preferred alternative. Uh, and then there's extensive amount of reference sections. So you can see all the different references that were used to prepare the information within the draft environmental document. Next slide, please. So let me walk through some of the, the key findings here. Uh, first, some of the project benefits. Uh, Diane already touched on some of these, but with regards to environmental benefits, the goal of the project is it, is it helps to reduce long distance travel along freeways, as well as city to city aircraft takeoffs and landings. This helps reduce energy consumption and demand throughout the region and state and then also provides substantial air quality benefits. Uh, and this again is within, within our Southern California region, as well as on a statewide basis. There's safety benefits with regards to the uh, positive train control that Bruce and Diane touched on. And then the great separations provide a great deal of safety uh, in terms of ensuring no conflicts with either uh, autos, bikes, or pedestrians. And then finally, jobs and economic benefits, um, employment uh, growth occurring both from the construction phase of the project as well as the operational phase. So our next slide, uh, this is where we get into some of the impacts. You can't build a project like this without having some impacts. 
Uh, these next three slides, I'll cover different, uh, different categories of, of impacts for each of our different topics, uh, environmental top resource topics, we identify key areas, key impact, uh, potential for impact. And even though it might say no significant impacts here, that doesn't mean there's no impacts, but it doesn't meet the criteria that have been established under the California Environmental Quality Act for what's considered a significant impact. So you can see a number of areas where we've identified no significant impacts under CEQA. Go to the next slide. There are a number of impacts uh, that were significant, but through applying mitigation measures, have been able to reduce those to a level below significance. A good example of this is noise and vibration during construction. Uh, construction can be a noisy activity, certainly. Uh, there's a number of measures that can be taken, whether it's limiting uh, work hours, locating construction staging areas away from residential areas or other sensitive noise receptors, where we can reduce those impacts so that they're not significant. With hydrology and water resources, uh, always a concern as far as runoff from a construction site. So a number of measures are put in place to ensure that uh, there's no impact to, to our uh, surrounding water bodies. Next slide. Uh, there are, however, some significant unavoidable impacts, and those are, are summarized here on this slide. I'll, I'll talk about noise, where we can see in the operational phase where the trains are running, uh, there are, are noise impacts, even with mitigation. There will be a number of sound barriers constructed with the project, but there are still some locations that won't receive sufficient protection and the noise levels exceed the federal standards. So we consider that a significant and unavoidable impact of the project. Uh, aesthetics and visual quality is another example where with some of the structures, uh, we, we have some areas where views are blocked and that's considered, you know, there's only so much screening of those uh, structures we can do, and that results in a significant and unavoidable visual impact. Next slide, please. Uh, property impacts. Uh, I've worked on a lot of transportation projects in my career, and the number one question I always hear at meetings like this is, how does this project affect me or affect my property? The authority has developed an excellent tool to help answer that question for you. It's an interactive map where you can plug in your address. And after our presentation, Henneveva is gonna demonstrate how this interactive tool works for you. Next slide. Uh, there will be property that will need to be acquired for the project. Uh, and there is a process that, that the authority follows. It's prescribed by both state and federal law. Uh, there's identification. Uh, we're at a very early stage of project design uh, 15% so that we don't have a set of plans that someone can go out and construct it now. But as the design is refined and gets to the, the more detailed level required for construction, then very specific right of way needs are identified through that. And then once that proper, those properties are identified, there's a, a formal appraisal that is done, uh, and then working through a negotiated process on the acquisition. And then finally, where there may be homes or businesses affected, providing relocation assistance. And we have our uh, right-of-way specialist, Jennifer Jones, with us tonight, if there are any questions regarding the authority's right-of-way process. Next slide, thank you. So just to recap some of the key things on the schedule, um, as Henneveva noted at the beginning of the meeting, the public comment period has been extended an additional 15 days until July 31st. So gives everyone a little bit more time to, to read the document and, and formulate their comments and questions. Uh, we identify where it's available as far as on the website and then the, uh, uh, both, both on the high-speed rail website and then there's some very specific materials on the Meet HSR SoCal website that's not noticed there. Uh, notifications, uh, the, the availability of the, the document was originally noticed uh, the week prior to the start of public review on May 29th, and additional notifications will be going out regarding the extension of the public comment period. Public comments can be submitted in a number of ways, uh, by good old US mail, uh, through the authority's website, by email. There's actually a telephone hotline set up if you wanna just call and say, here's my questions, here's my comments, here's my concerns. And then finally, we will be taking oral testimony at the virtual public hearing on July 8th. 
Next slide. Uh, so how to review the documents, just to sort of recap some of the earlier information. The real heart of the, the document is within volume one, and that's what contains the summary and all the other chapters and sections I described earlier. Volume two provides some technical appendices that have some of the more detailed data that supports the information in volume one. And then finally, volume three is all the engineering and design information uh, upon which the uh, environmental analysis addressed. And that enables you to take a look at the design plans and, and take a little bit closer look at uh, you know, both the rail plans as well as modifications, the proposed grade separations. Uh, so all that detail is provided in volume three. And for all of us non-engineers, that includes me, there's a user guide for volume three that will help you navigate that volume. And I should note that uh, while the entire document is not available in different languages, the summary of the document has been translated into Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, Tagalog, Armenian, Arabic, Korean, and Vietnamese, and all of those are posted on the authority's website. Next slide. As far as where to review them, the uh, copies of the document, uh, Unfortunately, uh, the libraries are still closed as of this date. However, uh, we know the uh, Burbank libraries are um, preparing to reopen. They are now accepting mail. So we've uh, sent the documents there so that once it opens, they will be available in the reference section. Uh, as of today, we have not heard any, been provided any opening dates for libraries in Glendale or in Los Angeles. Um, and then also, of course, the main Main access is via the authority's website and copies can be requested um, uh, by sending an email to records at hsr.ca.gov. Next slide. And next slide. Next steps. Thank you. Uh, so to just uh, the process where we go from here after the conclusion of the public comment period on July 31st, the authority will prepare responses to comments. Um, they will not be sending you back an individual personalized letter. Those comments are incorporated into the final environmental impact report, environmental impact statement. Uh, in that final EIR EIS, we make uh, revisions to it to address any factual corrections or clarifications needed in response to the comments. Uh, and then once that final EIR EIS is completed, that's published, made available to the public, and then it's presented to the Authority Board of Directors to consider approval of the project and the authority's issuance of a record of decision under NEPA and filing a notice of determination under CEQA. Next slide. And next slide, please. Diane talked about the stakeholder engagement about what's been done to date. Uh, this, this slide also focuses on uh, or just highlights uh, some of the specific notification that's been done for the availability of the draft EIR EIS. As you can see, it's been quite comprehensive between uh, publishing notices in various uh, area publications, uh, the direct outreach through extensive mailing that's been done, as well as e-blasts and social media. And then again, the new project focus website, which Enneva will be previewing for you in a moment. Next slide. Uh, up, upcoming meetings, uh, we have the telephone town hall on Monday, June 29th, and then the virtual public hearing on Wednesday, July 8th. And that's from 3 to 8 p.m. That doesn't mean you have to be there for the whole time, but the, uh, uh, the authority will be and taking public testimony for the duration of that period. There's also office hours, I should note, and uh, this is an opportunity where you just want to have you know, get an understanding, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about your concerns, and there's the website address there for how to request that appointment, and that is also posted on the authority's new project website. And this also provides the contact information. That's all available on the authority's website. And I thank you for your time, and I'm going to hand it back to Hannah Veva now to uh, carry us to the question and answer period. Thank you. Awesome.
Thank you, Rob. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists for your information. We hope that that was helpful to you to walk you through the big picture statewide information all the way down to where we are today here specifically for the Burbank to LA project section. Um, we are actively getting your questions um, through your raised hands. I have a couple of people with their hands raised um, and I will try to get to the questions that you are submitting through the chat box. Although I will encourage everyone, if you can please use the raise your hand um, um, option um, that we'll be getting to those first and I will get to as many of the chat questions as possible. Um, there's multiple questions from a few individuals there and we'll get to as many of those as we can. We have time. Um, but before we go to our question and answer period, what I'm going to do, as Rob mentioned, is switch over to our, um, our new uh, website. Um, which if you go on to, if you Google California High Speed Rail, you get to the authority's website. Um, for the Burbank to LA section, um, there's a new um, option that gives more specific information on today's open house and the environmental documents as we've been talking about um, that is specific um, to us. And it's here on this um, web address. We've been mentioning it during the presentation and I wanna highlight it here. It's meethsrsocal.org. So if you type that in, you will arrive on this um, webpage, um, which I will briefly review with you now. Um, and then if we have time, um, if we get through our questions, I will navigate it a little bit more deeply to show you where to find the various um, pieces of information. So this is the homepage on the Meet HSR socal.org website. Uh, and if you scroll down, as hopefully you're used to on websites, there's a few sections to it that I want to point out. This first section gives you just the information about the project, the fact that we've released the environmental impact report, environmental impact statement. Um, you can see here the new uh, due date or the new date of the end of the public comment period, which is July 31st. So you should see that throughout the website. Um, and then down here at the bottom, I just want to point out these three options, which is enter the open house, webinar information, and comment on the draft EIR EIS. So right here, right up front, is pretty much all the information that you need to know right at your fingertips. Um, before I go into the enter the open house option, um, I want to just point out that the webinar information for the which I'll go ahead and click on for the public hearing, um, as I mentioned earlier, is included here. And you'll find it on multiple locations in this website. So as you are familiar with how websites work, you find the same information in a few different ways. Um, so you find the webinar information here. So you see the information there on today's open house. And if you move down, you will see how to click and join to the meeting and all the specifics there. So going back, um, here on the main um, homepage is the comment uh, button. The comment button you'll see throughout the website in multiple places, but let me just demonstrate to you here. If you choose that option from the homepage, it goes straight to station six of our open house meeting, which is where you can go to comment on the web, um, on the environmental document. There's a video here. Um, it's just a short video just to outline to you how to submit your comments on the draft EI, EIR EIS. Um, but to actually do that from this location, you would click using the comment form on the authority's website here. That will take you straight to the authority's website and the form that you would need to fill out. And this is an official public comment that you would submit to the authority, including uploading documents if you so choose. And here's the submit button. So we really encourage you to navigate um, the website and be familiar with the form. Um, so that you know how to um, formally do that. Now, again, we'll review with you before uh, we are out uh, multiple times. There are many ways to submit a comment um, prior to the July 31st date. Doing the authority's website form is one of them. Um, Rob mentioned um, a good way to get a background on the document because it is quite voluminous. The volumes one, two, and three all have a, a tremendous amount of information, a lot of detail. Um, but the executive summary is a great way to um, review the document. Um, it, 
although I will tell you it is 74 pages and still, a, but a very good read to get a snapshot of it all. As you can see here, if you click on the English option, um, this will take you to, just navigate down, um, the comment form. So this is where you can do that in the appropriate language. Um, I'll navigate for you a little bit more to show you where to find um, the executive summary documents and how to provide further comments here. So this is, if I can go back to our homepage, um, just a quick overview on how to uh, get the webinar information and how to comment on the draft environmental document. If you go further down, as with every website, there are quick links, and these will just take you right to um, that part of the website for you to get that information. So, for example, if you want to access the draft document, you click on that but button, and it'll take you right to um, where all the documents are. So here is the executive summary in the multiple languages, the volumes one, two, and three. Um, so for example, here's the English, here's the Spanish, here is the Armenian, here is the Arabic, here is the Tagalog executive summary, here is the Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Um, just so you can see how that navigates, I'm clicking on the Arabic, um, and here are the 74 pages in Arabic for you to review if you so choose. Um, so this is a good way for to get, again, that summary information in the multiple languages um, to um, get a good understanding of the project. Again, volumes, the full volumes one, two, and three are here. If you click on that, it takes you to the document and you can navigate it fully here. Down here where it says educational materials um, is our repeat links for those executive summaries. And if you uh, navigate further down, you will see, here they are, volumes one, two, and three. You click on volume one, and as Rob mentioned, these are quite, um, long reports and so we have them organized into sections so you can click on the respective section in order to find the information that you're looking for. Again, if we have time, I'll navigate a little bit further um, before we uh, jump off, um, but I would recommend in each of the volumes to, to look at the table of contents document and that will help you also navigate um, on that particular report. Um, so if I go back to our homepage, I do want to point out that the open house, uh, our virtual open house meeting is available here on this first tab. Um, this is as if you were in the room with us um, at a public meeting in person um, and we were talking to you directly and wanting to share with you all the information. It's organized by stations. So this is the first station of the open house with the opening uh, video there from Bruce. Um, and in each of the stations, um, you can receive, um, you can actually look down here and navigate to the other stations. So this is the first station, second, third, fourth, et cetera. Um, another way to navigate the website to get that same information, many of you are familiar with these three lines that you often see on the phone apps. So it'll show up that way on the phone and it'll show up this way on your computer. If you click on that, this is another way to navigate the various stations. Um, as I mentioned, we, I showed you station one, and each one will walk you through each of those pieces of information, just like the panelists just did in the PowerPoint. I would like to point you toward station five. This is the station that Rob mentioned, where you, if you click on that, there's an interactive map um, that outlines the property impacts of the project and provides you actually really good information geographically about the project. So if you just click on that map, it brings you to an ARC GIS, um, very user-friendly map system. It's an interactive map um, that you can zoom in and out of to find points of interest that may be uh, of interest to you. Um, if I can just, before navigating this just for a minute, I want to uh, read to you 
uh, here a disclaimer, if you will. Actually, for whatever reason, it's not going further down. But the disclaimer that I have here on my screen um, is that while our really is our interest to provide as much public information to you in the document in different ways that is easy for the public to navigate, a map is an excellent way to do this. Um, however, I need to tell you that the web map presents the project footprint, which you see here in blue, um, as including potential property impacts. And this is based on preliminary engineering and subject to change during subsequent stages of project design. The draft footprint does not represent any commitment by the authority to disturb or acquire any property contained within these areas because the project design and associated land use areas are preliminary. Uh, the project is not yet formally approved and final design has not yet been completed. Um, however, the, the whole point of our open house meeting is to provide you the information as to where, what is being proposed and what, where we stand today. So that is part of the environmental process. It's legally required that the authority present to you what it's proposing and for you to have an opportunity to review and comment on that. So if I can just outline for you very quickly, because I really want to get to our questions, um, here on the bottom portion of the map are, is, is a, a dashboard that you can navigate with very familiar buttons for you, the zoom in and zoom out. Um, you can always click the home page to go back to where we started. Before I type in an address, I want to review these buttons. These, all of these buttons turn on and off. Um, various uh, features of this map that I would encourage you to play around with. Um, right now, I will show you the legend is the first button here. And this gives you the color coding or the legend for the map. So you can see the blue is the project footprint. The white dots are the two stations. And then many of you are already familiar with the color coding of the authority. This magenta color indicates a below grade uh, alignment the green color indicates surface alignment. And then specifically, I'd like to point out uh, the potential property impacts and the various colors associated with that. So for example, if we zoom in on the map, you can start seeing the various colors of the potential property impacts reveal themselves. Um, so that is really a nice feature for you to be able to see very specifically. Many of you, as you've come to our meetings in the past, would ask us the questions very specifically, which properties are am I going to be affected? And as the project was not standing still yet, we couldn't exactly tell you or show you these maps. Now we can, the document is released and this information is available to you. And so this is just another way for you to review it and, um, and see how the project may or may not be affecting an area of interest to you. The binoculars is another great um, feature of this map. Um, you can turn on and off some of these features so that you can look at the information a little bit more clearly. Um, so for example, including the property impacts, there's, they can go on and off, temporary construction, construction on and off, et cetera. Um, so you can play around with that and look at that a little bit more. There is a, a button here to indicate how to use the map. So if you're not sure, you can do that. Here, this button, uh, which includes the little fold-out map, is where you can search by address or search by assessor parcel number. Some real estate folks like doing that. So if you click on the assessor, assessor parcel number um, option, you can type in um, the assessor uh, number here, or you can see the list of the assessor parcel numbers that I already embedded into this map. So let's uh, do a search of our own. I'm going to search very quickly, let's say, Bur oops, Burbank. <clears throat> oops, if I could type correctly there, Burbank. Let's do the Chamber of Commerce. And did I get that right? There we go. Um, so if you do that, um, it'll take you right to that point of interest. Um, that's helpful because sometimes you just, you know, we all navigate maps in different ways. So sometimes that just gives you a quick method to, to find where you are in comparison to the alignment. Um, let's say another, uh, oops, excuse me, another uh, landmark or location. Let's do Cypress Park. 
and it takes you to that location. So um, I love these types of interactive maps. It's, um, you can type in an address, a landmark, an assessor parcel number, and it just, again, helps you navigate um, how the project is interacting with various locations in the community. Okay, so this is our interactive map. Again, I'll go back to the homepage here and you can uh, do this yourself. And if we have time, I'll come back to it and we can click around a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do now is go back to our PowerPoint presentation um, and have that available as we take a few of your questions. Um, what I will also remind you is to raise your hand on the Zoom screen um, for your questions. I already have a couple of, couple of you who have raised your hands and I'll get to the chat questions as well as we can go along here. We will be unmuting you um, so that you can ask your question verbally and our team member screen or camera will show as they're answering the question to you. So first off, we have a question for Marva Murphy. Um, Marva, if you can introduce yourself, if you have any affiliation and ask your question, please. Uh, I'm with the um, Burbank um, Council, Advisory Council on Disabilities. And my question relates to the airport uh, station. And I want to know what uh, provisions for pickup and drop off that are ADA accommodations at that station. Okay. Who would be the best person to answer that? Tyler, perhaps? Probably, yeah, I think so. I think that'd be me. <clears throat> um, so thanks for the question. Uh, there will be accessible uh, pickup and drop off locations at the airport station. I don't think we have it in the uh, PowerPoint itself. What I can point you to is uh, volume three of the environmental document is basically all of our design plans. And as part of that, there is a sub volume called six that is for the Burbank airport station there. And it shows a preliminary layout when it comes to uh, how you would access the station itself uh, from roadway, from bicycle, pedestrian, uh, pickup, drop off, et cetera. <clears throat> so that would be the place to show it. And there is uh, quite a bit of uh, frontage uh, to have people picked up and dropped off at the station there. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, Thank you, Tyler. And what I'll do is I'll try to go down um, to the various folks who have raised their hands and we can do follow up questions, Marva. So if you don't mind, if you have any other follow up questions, please feel free to raise your hand again. Just want to make sure I get to as many people as possible. Um, next, I have John Shardlow. Um, if you can please introduce yourself and any affiliation. Make sure you're unmuted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Had a, uh... That's all right. Um, I, and can I ask you to speak up or a little bit more closely to your mic? I, I'm not sure if we can hear you as well. Yeah, so my name's John. I'm counsel, land use counsel for Walmart. I'm trying to analyze the impact um, on, on the Walmart. There does appear to be some feature that goes through the front of the store. Um, it appears to be some access agreement that goes from the surface line to Victory. And I'm just wondering what's planned there. There's nowhere in the EIR that kind of discusses that component. Um, I've gone to the pop property lookup tool and really the only information I can get is that it has to deal with a partial acquisition. So I'm just wondering what kind of uh, feature is planned for the, uh, the front of the Walmart parcel. Front of the Walmart parcel. Tyler, could you hear that? Or Rob, um, would, could one of you take up that question? Yeah, I could hear that. Uh, and I, I believe it has to do with uh, an access easement to reach features that are in the back of the Walmart uh, next and to the railroad right of way group, there. Tyler, if you don't mind, um, can you just be more specific which Walmart where you're talking about just for benefit of the entire group? Sure. I'm assuming this is the Walmart uh, in Burbank on Victory. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the alignment runs behind the Walmart there. Uh, and I, I do believe I'll have to double check this, uh, that it is an access easement to be able to reach features uh, for the project that are behind the Walmart. Um, but I, I can look that up a little bit more and maybe get some more info a little bit later in this presentation. Great, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next up, I have Diane Robertson. Diane, um, if you can please introduce yourself, any affiliation, you're next. And 
I am not able to hear you. Make sure you are unmuted. Okay. Thank you for that. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. There you are, Diane. Yes, go right ahead. I'm a homeowner in Glendale, and I'm very familiar with the challenges of these train crossings at uh, Sonora, Grandview, and Flower, and I'm very excited to hear about these grade separations, Diane, that you were talking about earlier, and I was just wondering if you could share uh, whether or not you're proposing um, underpasses or overpasses for the uh, street traffic and pedestrians at, at those crossings. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? Um, yes, I know I, I can speak oh, to that. Oh, go right I ahead, think, Tyler, uh, perfect. Okay. Uh, it's basically a mix of both. <laughs> uh, so to do, uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be raising the railroad tracks up some and also lowering the roadways down some. And the intent with that is to try to minimize the impacts, especially to San Fernando Road and the businesses that surround uh, those crossings there. So I think the best way to think of it is that uh, it would go under the Western Bridge, uh, the tracks go up in the air to get over these three uh, with them being depressed some and then come back down to get under the bridge uh, for the 134 there. So it was kind of a split the difference approach that we thought had the least impact basically to the community there. Sounds good, thank you. But it, it, it would be the trains up and the cars going underneath them. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks for clarifying, Tyler. And then to help with um, those of you who have raised your hand, I'm going to kind of uh, give the lineup of the next speakers so that you know I'm coming to you. So next, next is Rick Corsini, and then following Rick, I'm going to come to Tamala Takahashi, and then I'm going to, at that point, be reading a couple of questions um, that looks like we received through our chat um, from a few of you. So we'll get to as many as possible. So for now, um, Rick Corsini, if you can please introduce yourself and um, any affiliation. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Rick Corsini. I'm uh, an architect and a, a property owner in the area. And I'm curious uh, to follow up on the last question uh, about the grade separations, uh, the modifications by others, uh, apparently by Metro at, oh. at Doran, Broadway, Brazil, and uh, I think what was the other one at um, uh, Sperry. I'm curious about how that's being handled, if it's, if it's being handled in a similar way as to your, uh, uh, as to the, uh, high-speed rail approach, or how is Metro approaching this? And actually, why is Metro uh, doing this and not uh, having this all under your auspices? Tyler, would that be you again? Sure, I think I can get it started and we'll see okay. if any other folks want to jump in or you might actually want to a little bit also. Um, basically, Metro is doing it because this is one of the highest priority crossings in the area from a safety standpoint. And uh, it is on a more expedited schedule, I would say, than this project. So they had started at a, a different time than this project here and uh, have basically been going along in their process as well to design and environmentally clear it. Um, <clears throat> this is focused on the two accurate crossings at Doran Street and Broadway Brazil. Uh, what is being proposed mainly is a new bridge over the tracks that would be in the area of Sperry and Salem. Uh, and then I think there also is some type of connection at Doran Street as well into Fairview, um, although I'm not too um, sure of that. Um, so the way that we treat it in this document is that basically this is something that Metro would be doing uh, that they would have done uh, before this project comes in basically for high-speed rail. So we expect that to be there soon. And uh, so we kind of assume that it is an existing condition and we are then basically going under the bridge that they built. So long story short, it is a high priority project for, for Metro that they're doing uh, irregardless of the high-speed rail project. And the, uh, are the plans for that available also online through Metro? So, so Metro has been doing a uh, Yes, an outreach process for that. I know there have been meetings in the area there. I don't know that there's been 
too much lately. They have been looking at it, uh, like I said, for some concepts uh, per request from the cities of Glendale and Los Angeles. There also is, I believe, a near-term project to try to improve Doran Street um, at grade until the bridges are built. Um, and so Metro would be the, the, the place to look for that uh, on the Metro project mm -hmm. uh, website. There is a site that uh, I'm looking this up now. One of my uh, colleagues sent this along, metro.net, and then it's projects, and it's called the Doran Street Railroad Crossing. So if you search for that, you can find the info okay. uh, that Metro has posted on their website. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Okay, I am going to ask the panelists um, a couple of questions from our chat box. Um, but those of you who are still online with us, please raise your hand if you have any other questions or comments following these questions. Um, we'll just keep going. Uh, our first question to the panelists uh, from Clyde. Hello, Clyde, out there. Um, is, the is a tunnel option, is a tunnel option from Burbank, Union Station, Subway Station considered as an alternative? So the idea of tunneling um, between Burbank all the way to Union Station. So I can uh, speak to that one. Uh, in the environmental document, no, that is not an option or an alternative that's considered to tunnel the entire way. Uh, we do have a tunnel, and I think Diane talked about it basically in the vicinity of Burbank Airport uh, that comes up to grade uh, in Burbank, uh, kind of behind the Walmart actually, uh, when you get close to Victory Place there. And then the rest of the way we are at grade. Um, there was a tunnel concept examined at the southern portion of the project from roughly State Route 2 into Union Station as part of previous alternative analyses, uh, but that was ultimately uh, basically rejected. And in 2018, the authority board selected the project as has been shown on these maps and as is uh, analyzed in the environmental document as the uh, alternative uh, that was that was done. So um, in the document, you're not going to see a tunnel the entire way from uh, Burbank Airport to Union Station. Thank you, Tyler. Um, and Clyde, I noticed you have a few other questions. I'm going to take a few other folks who have been raising their hand and I'll, we will get back to you. Um, next, I have Nathan Pena. And then after Nathan, I have a question, um, a raised hand from Diraj Narayan. Um, so first I'd like to go to Nathan Pena, if you can introduce yourself and any affiliation. Oh, hi, um, I'm just, I'm a homeowner uh, here at Taylor Yard in Cypress Park. Um, and I'm just looking at the map, I'm seeing that the whole, our whole community, about 55 homes, is uh, part of a temporary construction easement. I was just trying to see what that would look like, how to uh, see what to expect it would look like in the neighborhood, as well as the duration of the impact. Okay. We're just, just uh, I guess, south here of uh, Rio de Los Angeles Park. Sure. Now we know where, exactly where you are. Tyler. Uh, I think the actual construction easement is very small um, and it's on the peripheries of the property and typically has to do with uh, joining the existing parcels with the railroad. And if you think about maybe having a fence or a wall directly on the boundary line, we typically want to have a couple feet on either side of that to allow for construction to happen. Um, I, I will look in a little bit more detail here as well um, while we're doing this and see if I can have any more details on that easement. But um, typically also, I guess I could say for the construction process as we're going through, um, we've talked about something like two years um, in the case of grade separations. Um, the overall process I think we have defined in the document is approximately eight years um, from now until around 2029. Uh, and so, but it really depends as you um, look at the specific components of the project being constructed. Um, but most of our TCEs are basically for uh, the boundaries of properties to have them tie into any, say, differences in elevation that we have as part of our project. Okay, great. And I guess I can say, I can say in general, going through that area um, of the state parks and the, the new parks proposal on the river, uh, we, are, we are mainly focused on keeping our tracks within the existing uh, Metro-owned railroad right-of-way. Uh, there's basically two tracks there now. Uh, we're looking to add two additional tracks. Uh, those four tracks should fit within the typically 100-foot wide uh, that is the right-of-way through that area. And 
in most cases, the temporary construction easements or partial takes in that area or for small pieces next to the tracks, a uh, Kerr Road, we have to do some modifications to get it under the new tracks there and uh, some easements as well to get in utilities, uh, systems components, things like that. But we're trying to keep it very compact within the railroad corridor there. Nice. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, next, I have a raised hand from Diraj Narayan. Uh, Diraj, if you can introduce yourself and any affiliation. Make sure you're unmuted. And if not, uh, we can come back to you if you're having any um, audio issues. Uh, just chat with us and we'll see if we can come back to you. Uh, next, I'm going to take a couple of questions off of our chat. Um, we have a question here from Joan Hardy. Uh, Joan, thank you for your question. The question is, how are you all dealing with the recent criticism that this project suffers from optimism bias? Uh, also, there has been discussion about perhaps pausing the project, mainly due to the cost and complications of building this. I really want this project, but there seems to be an abundance of obstacles. Um, so perhaps Diane, would you want to take this question um, about project, the project moving forward? I can't, un am I unmu unmuted now? Okay. I can hear you, yes. Hi. Um, I'm going to start this and Bruce might want to add on to it. But this is a mega project. It's something that hasn't been done in this country before. And so it's hard to envision. It's very expensive. And if the people that are working on it aren't optimistic, it's never going to come to fruition. <laughs> so you can call it optimism bias if you want, but we believe in the project and we believe it's going to happen. It's going to be challenging to get all of the funding, but we are working on that. And one step in that process is to get environmental clearances for all the segments in phase one, so that when opportunities come up to apply for funding sources, we have gotten through the environmental approvals, which sometimes is a step in getting funding. Um, and it, what was the second part of the question, Hanno? Um, she uh, talked about pausing of the project, mainly due to cost and complications. Um, we, so is there an idea about possibly putting a pause? No, well, we're, the authority is about to get the business plan approved, the, the 2020 business plan. And we are going forward with construction in Central Valley and we are clearing the environmental sections in Southern California and Northern California. And, uh, you know, there's a phasing plan in place. So there is no talk of pausing right now. Bruce, is there anything that you want to add to this? Or yes. Uh, as part of my presentation, uh, well, I talked through how our project is part of the California State Rail Plan. So we are not slowing down with this project at all. We have 117 miles in construction in the Central Valley now. We are out to bid with our track and systems contract, which is essentially everything that makes the train go. The civil contractors build the dirt and the bridges, and then the track and systems contractor will come along and lay the track and put in all the electrification, communications, and train control. So we are not pausing at all. We expect, we hope, that our business plan will be approved at the end of this month at our board meeting, and uh, we will just continue to press on. And as Diane said, in a, in a mega project like this, <laughs> always obstacles, mm -hmm. there's always lawsuits because it's just the way it is. Eventually we expect, this, we expect to prevail because our project is transformative to California. We have the opportunity to have the first high-speed rail system in the country. We are far behind the rest of the world when it comes to high-speed rail. The Express West project is using the same propulsion system, the 25 kV system that we are, so there are lots, there's lots of momentum around true electrified high-speed rail service in this country and specifically here in California. We've created 4,000 jobs with this project to date. So there is no slowing down or pausing in my opinion. And of course you would say I'm biased because I work for the state. So <laughs> and, uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, as a as a mega project, it, it's definitely not done overnight and in phases. Um, Bruce, can you clarify um, how at once, let's say the the, the document is approved, um, the Burbank to LA project section environmental document is adopted. Um, what happens after that, and how soon can people expect? Um, what's the next step there? Well, after the project is approved, as Diane mentioned, it will be eligible for funding. Mm -hmm. And as we continue with both infrastructure bills on the federal level, and as we move through cap and trade and the development of our project and its funding sources, it will be in line and eligible for funding. Now, of course, that all has to follow Governor Newsom's building block approach, which the governor may have different priorities for us. But this clear, clearing this project gives us the opportunity to go for funding. And also, as I mentioned in my portion of this, we are, we are coordinated with the Metro Lake projects. So if we clear certain facilities like grade separations, like uh, additional track, MetroLink can make that part of their, uh, one of the projects that they would be using to advance a passenger rail initiative and use that facility until we come along and need it. So that's also the beauty of us clearing these projects at this time. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, long, a long-term effort uh, for a mega program like this. That's for sure. Um, we do have a raised hand from a Marion Bender. Marion, before I get to you, I just want to remind the audience here um, that our Spanish presentation, which is a repeat of this English presentation that we are a part of right now, will be commencing in about four minutes at 630. Uh, it's a separate meeting link um, with a separate call in number in case um, anyone uh, is interested. Um, I'll go ahead and repeat that in Spanish. Um, para que sepan todos ustedes, vamos a tener una presentación en español empezando a las seis y media, entonces como en cuatro minutos. Si quiere participar en esa presentación, que es una presentación completamente en español, por favor, puede uh, uh, aceptar o usar el link para esa, esa presentación. Gracias. Okay, um, back to Marion. Marion, if you are there, Marion Bender, if you can introduce yourself and your any affiliation. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Bender and I'm with the Atwater Village Neighborhood Council Community Greening Committee. Um, the topic I would love for you guys to address is the use of any sound barriers or walls alongside the track. As you know, in Atwater, it's very residential. So I'm looking at the area from Colorado Boulevard to the north to about Fletcher Boulevard to the south. Could someone talk about the use of sound barriers and walls on this section and at, and also address as residents how we could be sure that sound barriers would be installed in these areas. Excellent. Uh, would that go to Tyler? Who's? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Say Rob. I was going to say Rob, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, how about, how, yeah. How about Rob? Since uh, yeah, we're, we're, your camera going there, and um, participate with our panelists here. Give Tyler a break. I exactly. <laughs> and. Uh, and if you can start your camera, or are we in control of that, Eric? So we can make sure, uh, we can Rob. Yeah, it looks like you're in control. So right now, I'm just the name on the screen. Okay, uh, go ahead. So uh, oh, I have to start my video. There we go. Hello again. Um, so Marianne, I, I'm gonna. Uh, so you're, you're from Atwater Village. So there are uh, several uh, uh, sound barriers that will be constructed along the alignment. Uh, within the Outwater Village area uh, along the southbound side of the track from Fernando Court to south of Glendale Boulevard. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the placement of sound barriers, I guess I'll, I'll give a little description here. Uh, you know, we, we look at what the sound levels are, what existing sound levels are with uh, in the current environment, and then what it is with the addition of the high-speed trains. And so, and also with the shifting of the tracks, because that changes the future noise environment. <laughs> we then look at that and identify, you know, noise barriers are the typical method to reduce noise impacts uh, from the project operation. And so then identify where the placement of those barriers can occur. That becomes part of the uh, engineering consideration for the project. And then you, you had a second part to your question, Marianne. I, I, I didn't take a note on it. Could, could you restate? Because I, I, I know you had a second part as well. 
Sure. The second part was this, how as residents could we be sure that sound barriers are installed in places where we feel they're needed? Okay. Uh, well, certainly the, the sound barriers, you know, identified in the, in the project are uh, uh, commitments that the authority is making to provide those as mitigation measures. And as such, they are enforceable. Uh, the authority adopts a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, uh, and mitigation monitoring uh, enforcement program under NEPA. And so that is the mechanism. And one thing I'll, I'll say to you, as well as to other folks who have seen questions popping up on the chat where there's a concern about noise barriers, this is the sort of comment we're looking for, <clears throat> excuse me, on the document that if you're, if you're looking at the document and saying, hey, wait, I don't see a, a noise barrier in my area, <clears throat> why is that? We, we can address that comment in the document. Uh, sometimes it might be a case of where it's just not feasible to construct a barrier there uh, without making other changes that would have even greater impacts. And beyond sound barriers, the authority's noise mitigation also does provide for consideration of specific improvements at specific structures, typically in the form of either additional insulation or, or um, double pane windows, for example. So there's uh, uh, different methods to, to provide mitigation, but with respect to your community, an outwater village, there has been one identified and it's definitely a, a commitment the authority would make and follow through on uh, per the mitigation program in the document. Rob, would you just uh, repeat again the area that you were talking about that is supposed to have barriers? You said someplace to Glendale Boulevard. Could you repeat uh, that? Cor correct. It's from Fernando Court uh, to Fernando. south of Glendale Boulevard. Um, I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly how far south. I don't have that information right in front of me, but that is where uh, a sound barrier has been identified in, in your community. Okay, and so it is that south of Glendale Boulevard, which is a very specific area to my uh, focus. So how would I be able to find out how far south? Uh, Tyler, I, I probably will need a little help on this. I can't recall if in the, um, I think we just identified them in the document. The, the sound barriers are not shown on the, the preliminary design plans, correct? Correct, but we do have it if you look uh, basically uh, the noise and vibration chapter of the report, which is 3.4. Yes. Uh, and then down around page 51, there's a map uh, that shows the extents of it. And it's, it's basically Glendale Boulevard to kind of where that Silver Lake Boulevard uh, extension comes in. And then there's actually also one on the south side or the west side of the tracks that runs from roughly Los Feliz Boulevard to Glendale mm -hmm. Boulevard. Um, so there's there's two shown in the area uh, for Atwater Village there. <clears throat> and so, so and you did 3. say section three point four, page fifty one. Yes, there's a okay. map there that shows the locations of the sound barriers. Okay, yes, because <clears throat> we would definitely want it extended south of Glen of Silver Lake if possible. So I will go ahead and post that in comments. Thank you so much. And, and Thank you. just to make sure, do we clarify the section three point one? That's part of volume one. 3.4 3. is part of volume one, correct. So on the website, if we have a moment, um, uh, Marion, we can look at volume one and it's in volume one, section 3.1, um, but you can navigate that Three. as well. Thank you. Excellent. 3.4. 3.4. 3. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. It's, it's live information here. Okay, so I have another um, uh, question on the chat from Alex Davis and this might be a question that a couple of you have about the presentation being publicly available um, following today's open house meeting and yes the presentation that you're seeing today is publicly available following today's presentation on the website um, so again you can just google um, the high-speed rail uh, name go to the website find the Burbank to LA section and it's all there. I also will again be navigating for you the open house website uh, following our questions and answers assuming we have time and I can point you more toward where the, all of these various documents are housed. Um, okay so let me see if anyone else has their hand raised. Um, otherwise I'm going to 
get a few more folks. Oh, there's Diraj's uh, question, uh, who I was mentioning earlier. Um, so this may be also similar to um, the question that was just asked Tyler or Rob in relation to impacts close to the alignment. Uh, his his uh, question or comment is, I live less than 100 feet from the existing rail track and the proposed plan is to realign the tracks which move the tracks to no less than 50 feet from where I live. However, based on his review or I believe it's a he review of the draft environmental document. I am shocked that the report shows no impacts from noise or vibrations for his specific location. I need to speak to someone who can explain the analysis and why they don't believe there will be any impacts. Um, this might be a good, um, Diraj, you might be a good candidate for a phone appointment so someone can walk it through for you on the phone. Um, and I will be pointing that out, um, the office appointments that are available and how to do that. But Tyler or Rob, um, do you want to uh, address his question, even though you're not able to get sure. to the specifics? Um, but, but let us know what you think you're thinking. Sure. And, and it kind of goes back to what I said during the presentation that, uh, you know, with noise, of course, you know, we have impacts during both construction and during operation. And in the environmental document, of course, it may say there's no significant impact, but that may not mean that there's no impact at all. Um, in our noise analysis, we look at, um, you know, the criteria we work with, uh, published by the Federal Railroad Administration and Federal Transit Administration, identifies certain noise levels that, uh, you know, where if there's not, if it doesn't exceed that level, it's not considered an impact. That doesn't mean you don't hear the train. It just means it doesn't exceed those, those standards that have been established for rail projects here in the United States. Uh, again, as, as Heno, you suggested, I, it would be great uh, if he could schedule uh, uh, time and we can get down to the specific questions and uh, uh, if he provides a specific address, even I can consult my noise specialist. Uh, disclaimer, I am not a noise specialist, so I, I, I can't uh, uh, get into the details, but I could certainly, uh, with an address, we could provide very specific response for, to that question. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'd like to follow up with another question um, from Carol on our chat uh, function. Uh, she says, I live a few blocks from the existing train line. Why additional lines uh, if in fact there are existing, how often will the high-speed train go through in addition to other trains through the area, especially in the evenings as noise is loud enough now? Thank you. Um, so can we, someone talk about the frequency, the planned frequency of the trains? Well, I, I can talk a little bit about service planning. We're planning for uh, for six trains per hour in the final condition. So that's in 2040 when we do phase one. There'll be six trains per hour per direction during the peak period. Um, off peak, there'll be something less than that. Uh, and of course that depends on demand and ridership forecasts and whatnot. But our trains are not noisy at all. It's an electric train, so you don't have an engine you know, making that noise and will be fully grade separated, so they won't be blowing horns. I don't and, know. and her question was focused on the evening hours. So six trains per hour in both directions would be the maximum during peak. Uh, Max. So something less than that uh, during evening hours, and it's an electric train, so the noise Correct. would not be what people are experiencing today with the Metrolink train, for example. Correct. I know the only other thing I'd add on this part is, um, and Bruce kind of hit on it, but we did operations modeling as part of this project. And what it basically showed is that we couldn't fit all of the trains, especially when we get to 2040 and later on just those existing two tracks. So there's more tracks needed to provide uh, the capacity uh, for those trains to come through in the future. So we, we did look at it and kind of the number of tracks was set based on that. <clears throat> Um, it looks like I have another raised hand. Um, so thank you for raising your hand from Carol. Um, and that may be the same individual whose question I just read. Carol, is that you? Yes, it would be. It's, it's the same person. I'm sorry, I have a follow-up to that if you guys Please don't. Please do. Please, yes. Um, so that would be an additional six trains per hour in addition to the Amtrak and the Metro that are currently running. 
So even though the um, high speed rail is not, you know, with a horn blaring, this still a, there's enough vibration that it's going to cause some kind of noise in addition to again the existing metra and the Amtrak going by. I mean, I didn't realize 14 years ago when I uh, moved into this and that um, I was that close to the trains. I guess shame on me for not knowing. No. But, um, it, it's, it's what community, Eric Carol? Do you live? I in? live right off of um, um, Riverside Drive two blocks off San Fernando Road, basically. That's where I'm at. So the trains are right there. And like I said, you know, in the daytime I'm working from home right now, you hear it, but ob obviously it's not as pronounced as it would, would be in the evening. So mm -hmm. I'm, my gosh, now we're gonna have a high-speed rail in addition to the other two trains going And How is that gonna be? Is it time for me to move? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. It's important to think of time frame. So, um, Tyler, would you want to make reference to that when she could expect um, if everything falls into place uh, when that might be her experience? Well, I'll, I'll say this, and Bruce kind of hit on it earlier, and especially, um, sorry, I'm, I'm assuming this is Riverside Drive by San Fernando Road down by kind of uh, Cypress Park. Um, <clears throat> okay. In that area, the high-speed trains really aren't going to be going any faster than the Metrolink and the Amtrak trains go right now. And that's going to be the case for most of the alignment as well. Um, just because we're in an urban corridor, we're not going, I think Diane hit it on it also, we're not going 200 miles per hour. We're going pretty close to the speed that the trains are going through there right now. So it's really going to be more trains with similar speeds. Um, although, like Bruce said, it'll also likely be quieter because it is uh, electric. Um, how we actually build up to those service levels is uh, is pretty tough to predict right now. Like Bruce said, it depends on ridership demand, uh, operating money be of being available for local and state agencies. So we have a projection of that for 2040, but reality between now and then, it's really going to depend on on uh, on how the passenger levels determine how many trains are needed. Correct. <clears throat> We hope that's helpful, Carol. It's, it's all part of planning, which is a very important part of why this information needs to go public so people are informed about um, when the planning horizons and potential construction horizons and operations would occur for a program like this. So as you can see, it's very long term of and uh, funding does need to get into place um, prior to it going. But it's good that you're informed now um, so that you can plan uh, going forward. Um, yeah, um, just what, what Alf Tyler just said, since it's not going to be going 200 miles an hour in this area, obviously, then does that mean that is why, or probably why there would not be any sound barriers then in this specific area? Uh, I, that probably contributes some to that, but I'm yeah. not sure if that's the specific reason why or why not. Um, it, it's a lot of vagaries into modeling the noise and the vibration levels that come along. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to get to a few more questions off of our chat. Um, a question from um, Marge Pion. Uh, she, in, she is asking, where can hard copies of the draft environmental document be viewed given that our libraries are closed? Um, so I know that um, the hard copy documents are available at the authority offices. Diane, um, would you uh, have any other information for Marge on that line? I don't, I frankly don't know what the state policy is because, uh, you know, all these other venues are closed. Currently, no one is working in the office and it wasn't clear to me that they were available in the office. I think they fell in the same category as the gotcha. libraries. Bruce, you're talking on mute. Did you want to add anything? No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So we are we are limited um, because of the um, the the closure or the offices remaining closed right now given the um, pandemic. Um, I would encourage folks to request documents through the website, um, and we can navigate that, um, assuming we have time before 7:30, um, as to where to receive and or download electronic versions of the document. Um, it's quite uh, large um, in terms of its paper form, 
um, but we want to make sure we get it to you in one way or the other. So um, we are monitoring the public libraries as to their potential reopening and are ready to go with placement of the documents there. So please stay um, abreast on the website. Um, those announcements would be placed there. Um, and again, we have a little bit of time, but the electronic versions are obviously immediately available, and I would encourage you to, to look at that. Um, okay, we have another uh, question um, from Wen Chen. Uh, where in your environmental document can I see more information about the proposed grade separation um, at North Main Street in the city of LA, like the preliminary structural type, um, alignment, and profile? Uh, so maybe Tyler, can you uh, maybe point us toward where that type of information would be found in the document? I can, yeah. So volume three uh, is the engineering plans uh, for the document. Uh, as part of that, there's another volume three, uh, which is for grade separations. Uh, and towards the back of that is the plans for Main Street. It's page 120 to 130. And um, I guess I can say so volume three design plans, volume three of that. Um, I also did get some other info for some of the folks that had the questions earlier um, for the Walmart area. Uh, in that case, it's volume three again. So the design plans uh, of that volume four, which is focused on systems and part two of that. <laughs> Write this down, sorry. Uh, and then page page 136. And, and what it shows there is that there is a signal house proposed uh, basically behind the Ulta actually. Um, for a new basically track that is needed there for Metrolink and that is just an access easement uh, to allow access to that signal house um, that's located behind Empire Center there. And then uh, I also did check on the TCEs in the area of the Rio de Los Angeles State Park um, and yeah, they are just TCE. Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. That's what that stands for, yes. Uh, <laughs> so those are just right along Kerr Road and the railroad tracks and basically come out a couple feet in most cases to allow, like I said, for the joining if there's been a, a slight change in elevation or a wall or things like that. So uh, the rest of the property is not really affected. And I think you can see that with um, the interactive map you showed and the footprint there as well. You can see that the line is just a couple feet away from the existing property line. Okay, great. Thank you, Tyler. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to take a couple more questions here um, that we am seeing on the chat function um, from Chris F. Have there been studies that model the impact to people living adjacent to the high speed rail trains? What will the noise and other quality of life impacts um, be to its neighbors? Um, so maybe Rob, would you want to take that question? Uh, sure, uh, because um, yeah, it's important to remember particularly well for all of the studies noise air quality we don't just evaluate the properties that are directly adjacent to the to the alignment we, we look some distance out uh three four hundred feet away to look at what those effects might be uh with regard to how it might affect the communities um i believe in uh section 3.12 of the document which discusses socioeconomic effects and community impacts we talk about any of these changes, we address whether they might affect the cohesiveness of a community, the ability for people to, you know, as they uh, connect with their neighbors, as they travel to local businesses, do we have any effect uh, on, on the community cohesion itself? So we address community impacts in a number of ways in the document, both kind of the technical side, the air quality, the noise effects, um, but then also, again, just general things as far as are we affecting <clears throat> people's ability to, to access, uh, access amenities in their community that they access today. Thank you, Rob. Um, and again, if we have time, what might be a good idea is um, we can actually navigate the website and kind of open up a few of the volumes and point, just get people familiar with what that looks like. We can. Um, that might be helpful as well. Okay, so it looks like I don't see any raised hands at the moment, but I do have a couple more questions. Um, Clyde, I'm coming back to you, um, that you submitted on the chat function. So let's see if we can get through a few of those. Um, for his first question is, what are the seismic magnitude, depth, 
distance and duration parameters used for the designs for any elevated structure. So in relation to elevation, um, the seismic factors, uh, the design factors are surrounding that and have they been reviewed by SCEC Caltech USC. So would that be a Tyler question? Sure. <clears throat> so I can speak to it in more general terms. Uh, I don't think I can speak to the specific magnitude and depth and things like that. Uh, what I can say is that our designs follow uh, a large set of different design criteria uh, that is set by the authority. Um, they are listed on the authority's website under uh, a project level environmental and engineering guidelines, studies, and reports. And there's a large number of technical memorandums that are included in that. Uh, in the case of seismic, that's many of those are in uh, Tech Memo 2.10. And in a general sense, they're based on Caltrans standards. Uh, they look at uh, a maximum earthquake that can be expected uh, based on seismic conditions around the state and then design uh, to those criteria. So uh, I don't know of any specific reviews uh, by say Caltech or USC for say our design since we are still at the fairly early stage. Um, but they're, they're based on more general seismic standards set by Caltrans that may have some coordination with some of those uh, institutions as well. So there's nothing particularly unique to our design compared to the rest of the state. It's designed uh, in concurrence with the standards, the design standards that we have for this project and for all the high speed rail project across the state. Okay, great. Thank you, Tyler. Um, follow-up question or similar. Um, if, if Clyde wanted to know about specific clearances, um, he indicates a few different locations above the LA River levees, um, beneath the high volt power lines on both sides of the river, um, above SR 110, 15 interchange. Um, don't suppose you know those off the top of your head, Tyler, or you can talk generally or point them toward where he could find that in the document. Yeah, I can speak to some of them, um, not super specific for all of them. Um, when it comes to the Los Angeles River and the kind of clearances, uh, we have those set based on fairly detailed hydraulic studies. Uh, I, I can say that we don't have a lot of new bridges over waterways as part of this project. Uh, basically, we're going to be crossing the Los Angeles River on the existing bridge that Metrolink uses to cross it now. Uh, and we'll have a new bridge built over Verdugo Rosh, Wash right by uh, State Route 134. Um, so we have a fairly detailed hydraulic design process that is used to figure out uh, the effects on floodplains and rivers and things like that and ensure that uh, it's basically built uh, based on the design criteria for hydraulics. Uh, when it comes to railroad tracks, uh, we have similar criteria which define the horizontal and the vertical clearances around railroad tracks. Um, in a very general sense, it's typically 24 feet. Um, and that is often what you can get if you have two uh, containers stacked on top of each other for a freight train and often what Metrolink trains are as well. Um, so in most cases, we're at 24 feet or more uh, if we're looking at railroad clearances. Um, high, high, high voltage power lines, uh, those are often set by the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, and once again, in a general sense, they're often 34 feet um, from the ground to whatever high voltage power line is up there. Uh, but they'll be designed, uh, designed based on CPUC standards. And then uh, finally, for high speed rail tracks themselves, say at the different interchanges, once again, it's around 24 feet. Uh, in the case of the SR-110 I-5 interchange right by Cypress Park there, uh, we will basically be following the existing tracks for the most part. So um, the freeway bridges are above and the railroad tracks for high-speed rail will generally stay close to where they are now. Great, thank you, Tyler. Um, I do have another question from Clyde. Clyde, it's like um, talking to you at the open house. You always are with a lot of good questions. Um, this one I think we can answer pretty simply. You're asking about um, the Chinese translation for the um, NOA and the uh, executive summary, if it's in the classic Chinese or modern um, Chinese format, it is the modern Chinese format, otherwise known as the simplified format. So that's the version of Chinese uh, translation that we have in that document. Um, 
I believe you may have asked one more question about the environmental justice section, Clyde. Uh, the question uh, to the team is, will there be a section for environmental justice? Um, and second um, part of that question is to define feasible. So that's a broad question as we use the word feasible um, in relation to the environmental planning. So uh, Rob, would you like to address those two questions? A absolutely. Uh, there is an entire chapter uh, devoted to the discussion of environmental ju justice. That's chapter five in volume one of the draft EIR EIS. And in that we first identify where those uh, communities, uh, environmental justice communities are located uh, along the alignment. And then we go back through and address each of the effects that we've discussed within chapter three and identify whether any of those have a disproportional impact to those communities. With regard to feasible, I found it's always better than just uh, to uh, try and memorize something. We absolutely use the definition of feasible. I think I mentioned that in the presentation with regards to uh, mitigation measures, and that is a legal requirement uh, for any lead agency in California. Feasible means capable of being accomplished in a successful manner within a reasonable period of time, environmental, legal, social, and technological factors. So all those considerations apply as the authority has considered a mitigation for the significant impacts of the project. Excellent, Rob, you're definitely the right guy to ask that question, to answer that question, thank you. Um, okay, so I do see that I've, um, kind of gone through all of our questions that we received through the chat. Um, and I also see that I have a hand raised again, Rick, Rick Corsini from you. So happy to take your question now. Yeah. Try that again. I cannot hear you. How's that? Is that Go there? ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you you addressed some of the questions in a previous answer uh, a little while ago, uh, but specifically around the uh, the G two site and the Bowtie site uh, and that transition between the two freeway into the uh, into the um, uh, one ten and five uh, intersection. Um, but specifically, I know there's a, a the G two planners have been. Uh, looking at ways to bridge the gap between the, um, the uh, high-speed rail alignments and the power lines uh, and to bring the um, uh, Rio de los Angeles uh, State Park towards the new um, improvements planned for the LA River. So I'm, I'm interested about what the coordination has been like between you and the uh, Los Angeles Bureau of Engineering in terms of that uh, that huge knot of converging infrastructure. So would that be Tyler or Tyler, you wanna start off? I, I can speak a little bit to the technical side of things. I think coordination is, is more um, what Diane focuses on. Uh, <clears throat> Like I talked about earlier, we're basically building additional tracks next to the existing tracks through this area. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're doing our best to uh, keep our impacts out of the parks. In fact, we have to do a specific uh, 4F impact analysis that looks at parks and recreational facilities. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any specific connections between uh, Bowtie G2 or Rio de Los Angeles State Parks at this point uh, as part of this project. Um, we're mainly focused on the uh, railroad side of things, and uh, the main access into G2 is assumed to still be Kerr Road, um, and we do have some modifications there to get it under our basically widened railroad bridge. Um, so that's that's kind of the extent I think that I can speak to the the physical design of it. And Diane, do you want to talk about coordination at all? Sure. So we have been coordinating with the city of LA on all parts of the alignment that are related to the city of Los Angeles. We have group meetings sometimes with the engineering department and the planning department and others. Um, the city of Los Angeles has had the opportunity in advance to review the 15% design 
So we have been coordinating with them, not just with this, but on other areas where we impact the city of Los Angeles. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we've received another uh, question from Diraj uh, Nargayan um, in relation to Taylor Yard. So um, we're talking about in the same general vicinity here. Taylor Yards also also has three existing low income affordable housing communities and another affordable housing project under construction. Wasn't any environmental justice impact considered on this community? Um, so maybe back to you, Rob, are you able to speak to this? Not to, not to necessarily the specific community. I mean, we look at, uh, you know, the analysis considers uh, demographic information, uh, population information uh, based upon uh, currently available demographic data. As far as if a area is, is identified for future uh, low income housing, that wouldn't necessarily be, uh, be identified in that analysis. But we certainly look at, um, you know, we look at the larger area. It's not a parcel by parcel analysis. It's really census tract by census tract. So given the surrounding area, I would expect that that would be in there. And I would in, encourage the, uh, the, the person asking the question to you know, take a look at our analysis within chapter five of the document. And it'll be a more, there'll be a more focused discussion. And that may, uh, may answer the question. But with regards to consideration of specific future low income developments, no, that, that was not specifically addressed in that discussion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, we have another raised hand from one of our attendees, um, Brian Rupp. If you can introduce yourself and any affiliation, please. Hi, yeah, my name's Brian and I'm just a resident up in the hills above the airport, Burbank Airport. Uh, I'm currently looking at the plans you guys have, but uh, this is where you have the station planned is currently an industrial complex that's being constructed right now. Um, do you have alternate plans for where the station is or um, what are your considerations for that property? Tyler, would that be you? Probably a mix of me and Diane. Um, I guess the answer is yes, that is where uh, the Avion site is having uh, construction going on right now. And that is the proposed location of the high speed rail station. Uh, we would go through the normal acquisition process, I think, if we wanted to uh, put the station, continue to have it there, which is the plan right now. And uh, it's located there to maximize access to the airport terminal that's planned uh, in that area. So, Diane, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, yeah, so this, I mean, this actually speaks a little bit to the previous question about future development, which is that this project has been in, under study for so long that the owners of the Avion development and the idea of the Avion development wasn't even under consideration when we started doing our analysis and in our, what we call our base year. So, um, you know, we, we talk about that a little bit in, in the text portion of the document, even though it's not included in the analysis, we are aware of it. Uh, we have even visited with the owners of the Avion development. This project is still a number of years away. Um, so what Tyler said about the acquisition process is true. As we move forward, uh, that was identified as the best location for the station. And when the time comes, we will have to work with the owners and there will be some property acquired. At the moment, uh, we believe that the footprint that's in the project, what we call the footprint, uh, is maybe larger than what we're going to need in the future when we go into further stages of design. Um, one of the slides that I showed earlier was to the extent possible when we can use existing facilities, we will do that. So I believe our footprint right now calls for uh, quite a bit of parking that would be on the property where Avion is. And you know the, the authority is constantly looking at planning criteria. And the first thing that would be done is to look at what available parking might be in the area that has capacity for some or all of our passenger demand. So at 15% design, we are a long way um, 
from when this is going to happen. And we will be working in coordination with property owners and the city. And we're in the vicinity of the airport. We'll be working with the airport authority to the extent that we have impacts there. Um, does anybody have anything else that they want to add? Okay, um, I hope Brian that that answers your question. Obviously, um, a lot of planning going on in the various communities, a lot of demand on the various properties. Um, the High Speed Rail Authority obviously has to plan um, in conjunction with other projects and timing of projects and available funding on projects obviously impact um, the sequencing and the coordination on these various projects. So um, that is continuing and um, please follow up if you have any additional questions. Um, it looks like I have uh, gone through all of the inquiries on our chat and have addressed everyone's raised hand. Um, if it's okay with the group, um, I've noticed that our participation is dropping off just a little. We have, um, I should have mentioned earlier, we had up to 100 participants on our um, open house meeting and we're now in the 60s. Um, so I would very much like to still um, invite you to um, to just stay with us um, and I can navigate a little bit more on the website um, and perhaps even um, do our interactive map and maybe uh, look into some of these locations a little bit more. Um, I do wanna um, take a moment though to re-emphasize um, that in case any of you are dropping off um, that the public comment period again has been extended to Friday, July 31st. Uh, we have plenty of time now to, um, or can, a little bit more time to review the document and to provide us your comment. We very much encourage you to do so. Um, we uh, also have our public hearing on July 8th, um, and that will be a virtual meeting just as we're doing today, but a formal meeting where uh, individuals will be given the opportunity to provide their public comments and that will be recorded for the record. Um, you should be receiving additional information about our telephone town hall coming up on Monday, um, June 29th. Do I have that date correct? Um, and we should, um, that is an opportunity for you to, um, to engage again with the project team and ask questions and have a conversation in a telephone town hall format, which is very helpful for you all to hear each other and for there to be a conversation engaged on the project. Again, that would be public information only. Um, I encourage you to use these various methods for submitting a formal comment on the project. Um, we are, as always, will receive traditional mail, um, mail to the authority office. Um, you see that address there on the screen, which is also available on the authority's website. Uh, Pub, formal public comments as well can be submitted on the website as I showed you on the form earlier. Um, you could also email uh, your comment um, for at your convenience. Make sure the subject line indicates draft EAR EIS comment so that we'll know that that's an official comment um, that's being received to the Burbank to LA email address. Um, your verbal comment um, in any language is also welcome um, to the authority's project uh, telephone line. Um, you see the line here that is specific to the Burbank to LA project. That number is 8877-977-1660. And you can record, you just follow the prompts on the phone line to record your public comment and that would also be considered a formal comment. Um, and of course, as I mentioned already, your oral testimony at the virtual public hearing to be held on July 8th. Um, that will start at three o'clock and we will take public comments all the way through eight o'clock PM, just as we would in an in-person setting. Um, all of these forms of submitting of public comment are equal. Um, so we will accept it any way um, as you prefer to submit it. Again, please make a note of that extended due date of July 31st. All right, so what I would like to do now is uh, switch over my screen back over to our website um, and panelists, if obviously you can stay with us. Um, and in case there's any questions, feel free to still raise your hand as, as I'm navigating and we can perhaps focus on a few of these things. So as I mentioned before, this is the homepage of the meethsr.socal.org website. 
Um, you can navigate you know, anywhere on the website from here. I reviewed with you earlier the quick links to jump to the various parts of the website. Um, so let's just go to the draft document itself again. This, if you click on that quick link, it takes you to what is called station four, draft EIR EIS. And this is where you find the executive summer, summary in the various languages. And here's volumes one, two, and three. So if we click on volume one, which is the actual full report, um, you will get kind of the baseline information about the project, all the environmental uh, language to make sure um, you know um, what the context of the document is. Um, and down here is where you could um, see copies, oops, excuse me, copies of the environmental document here. Um, if to request those, someone asked earlier if you can get a copy of it. Um, this is where you would email um, the, the authority to request an electronic copy. You could do that. You could also, since the document is large and it's available, um, as you'll see as I navigate a little bit further down here, um, to volumes one, two, and three. So as you'll notice, what I was mentioning is when you click on volume one, it's not one file, but actually multiple files that you could click on. Here's simply the cover. Um, you could always download that if you wanted to, but this, as you can imagine, are pieces of the document um, that uh, are put together for your viewing online in a manageable format. These, are, these files can be quite large, so they are separated um, by section. So um, both Tyler and Rob earlier were, were talking about specific sections in um, the document in answer to some of the folks questions. So here in volume one, which is the main report where all the analytics and impacts um, are included, um, they made reference, for example, to the noise and vibration section, section 3.4, and here it is. So if you wanted to delve into that further, um, it looks like it's a 56 page document um, that starts here, section 3.4, and you can navigate um, all the way down to read about noise impacts. Um, each section is organized um, as required by the environmental law and all the various impacts, mitigation measures, um, and descriptions are included here as required. It's quite detailed, um, but you can see uh, by going through it, it's organized uh, geographically. And if you peruse it, you can find um, the various sections that may pertain to your specific question. Um, I won't go through the entire document. It is quite long, um, but you get the idea. And I would just encourage you to, to look at that a little bit more closely. Uh, here is volumes two and three. Um, volume two has all of the technical appendices. So if you wanted to look at those studies a little bit more closely, they are listed here and you can see the various um, topics of those technical studies. Um, you can click on children's health and safety risk assessment, for example, and pop right to that document. This looks like it's a 22 page document um, and you could again navigate it. Um, I like looking at the table of contents to just kind of see what type of content is in this particular file and how to jump to specific sections that may be of more interest to me. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. So each, um, each uh, link under these um, volumes um, take you to that section in, in its entirety. Um, so I would encourage you just kind of navigating through, through that and seeing um, you know, what information may be of interest to you. Volume three, uh, for those of you who are interested, is where all the engineering drawings and discussion is. Um, this document specifically is called the Preliminary Engineering for Project Definition, or otherwise known as the PEPD. Um, and again, it has uh, quite a bit of, of the planning um, and maps and um, profiles for the project. So for example, if you clicked on, I clicked on one of the volumes here. Um, and as Tyler was mentioning earlier, in volume three, it has a separate set of volume numbers associated with it. So this is uh, volume one, which is 
uh, the general track alignment and right-of-way. So you can see this is a 161-page document. Um, it says it right up here. And if you go down, it will show us the various plans and profiles associated with the project. Um, it gives you the specific, um, there's the blue line in terms of the proposed project, and that's the overview of the, of the project. And then it continues with the um, index so that you can look at this document specifically along these various lines. It's it starts big picture and with the indices of all the various drawings. And then if you navigate further down into the document, it's taken a while for it to catch up with me because it's so dense. Um, you can actually see the various drawings that are proposed for the project. Um, for those of you who are so inclined, you can look at that um, and get the full information. Um, I'd like to go back to the executive summaries, um, which are contained here under the educational materials. This is the executive summary, another way for you to get at it in the multiple languages. I'm going to click on the English here. Um, I would encourage, this is a 74 page document, as I mentioned earlier. Um, for a snapshot of the impacts associated with this project, I'm going to scroll all the way down, if you forgive me, because that's kind of hard on the eyes. Um, but we'll go all the way down, and there's a really um, cool table um, which helps summarize um, the impacts across the various, as we call them, resource categories. So in the executive summary, um, it starts on uh, here, this table S5, it looks like it's page 67, if I can see that correctly. And it starts with the transportation section and you can see that it takes category by category. The second column is the summary of the significant impact before mitigation, the summary of the mitigation measures that are associated with that impact, and the level of significance after mitigation. This is a very good summary for you to get a big picture snapshot of all of the significant impacts associated with the project. It's a, several pages long um, and available at the end of the executive summary. So that's a good resource for you as well to, to take a look at. Okay, so, oh, looks like we got another question that came through on the chat. So I'm gonna go back to um, my homepage just to kind of sit there while we take this question. Um, again, this is how the website is organized. I'm going to leave that on the screen for a second and take um, our chat question. So from Marianne, hi Marianne again, um, on the EIS, is the southbound track technically the west side of the track? That should be a simple answer. Um, again, is the southbound track uh, technically the west side of the track. So, um, Tyler, would that be your question to answer? That would be me. Yep. Uh, yes. So, it's it's pretty how much about, like a roadway. Yeah, how about uh, the train map? And I'll navigate yeah. a little bit if you want to direct me. Go right ahead. Uh, so, the trains typically going south are going to be on the west side, uh, and the trains going north are going to be on the east side. Um, so that's, I think, in the noise section, we kind of call things northbound, southbound. Um, but yeah, so north, southbound high speed trains are typically going to be running on the west side of the railroad right of way. Kind of as you would expect, right? right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Um, Double checking, making sure we don't have any other raised hands or questions. So why don't we take a moment to uh, navigate a little bit more um, on the map. Um, so um, we can go to um, Union Station, let's see. So we had a few questions surrounding Union Station. So if you were to navigate in, you can zoom in um, uh, pretty close um, as you can see some of the various um, landmarks. There's the San Antonio Winery, uh, which um, I know is very popular in the area and how the project is planned around that. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, if you were to search by parcel number, um, a nice feature of this um, 
interactive map is if you click on one of them and apply it. Um, the parcel numbers actually, if I can close this, um, let me try that again. I was able to turn on the parcel numbers. Sorry about that. Um, I'll have to navigate this a little bit better, but the, each of the parcel numbers have their um, as, um, APNs or um, assessor parcel number associated with them. Um, and they do show up on the map as you click on them. So if you were to type it in, um, it would sh that, that particular parcel number would show up. Um, you can also, um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, turn on and off different parts of the um, map so that you can see um, the various um, parts of the map a little bit better. So in reference to the footprint, um, which I will turn back on there. Um, here is the project footprint in blue. The project footprint is literally the um, impact area or the design, the area of design for the project. So um, it is important, it's not just um, obviously the corridor or the right of way itself, but the project um, uh, needs uh, or may be affecting um, other parts immediately adjacent to the project. So the project footprint, as it's referred to, is very important for you to keep track of um, as you navigate the alignment. Um, and that's another very important part about the um, environmental document is that it communicates or presents to the public uh, very clearly um, what it's being what's being proposed. Um, so you can find the same information on those engineering drawings, or you can navigate this website um, to help you kind of see that a little bit more visually in, in a simple, simpler way. Hello? Do we have Hello, this is Rob. Can I, can I add a clarifying statement here? Please. Um, and I think it came up in one of the questions we heard earlier this evening. So people are probably looking at these parcels going, oh my gosh, they're going to be acquiring the... Uh, the entire Burbank Airport, and that, that's not the case at all. Uh, what's shown here is the entire parcel boundary of any parcels that were affected. And I think this question came up earlier when someone was saying, oh, I see this big uh, temporary construction easement over you know, our entire neighborhood. And it's, it's really just a case of where um, the parcel is highlighted, but it may only be a portion of it that is required for either that acquisition or easement that's necessary. And I, I just, that thought came to mind as you were walking through this that I, I don't want people to get the wrong impression when they see this entire parcel boundary map that uh, the entire parcel is needed for the project. G great point, thank you for pointing that out. Um, very important to reveal to folks, you know, what the limits of those parcels are, but obviously um, it's not, um, it's not, uh, it will, as, as indicated on the legend, we try to indicate the type of acquisition or the impact to that specific property. Is that correct, Rob? Cor correct, yeah. So, so we're not, the, the, the entire Burbank Empire Shopping Center is not being partially acquired. It's just that portion there, uh, you know, uh, just whatever sliver is needed for, for the work that's required. Correct. And I would really encourage folks to, um, uh, if you have, if you are a property owner or have an interest in a particular location to set an appointment um, on those office hours with the team, um, I will, before we adjourn, oh, well, we're almost to 730. Um, so you know what I'll do is I am going to go back to our PowerPoint presentation um, because I do want to show um, the office hours um, that we want to encourage you, if you have specific questions um, on a property, as I was mentioning, um, or want to just follow up on some of the questions that you had here um, that you got like an early answer to, but want to talk to folks a little bit more. Um, these are the um, dates um, where the staff will be available. Um, so on the website that we were just um, showing down there at the bottom in the, um, uh, the quick links. Uh, you can cl click on one of those links to schedule an office appointment. Um, and these are the dates that you have to choose from. So I would really encourage you to do that. 
Um, the staff loves talking about the project. They've been working on this quite some time. Tyler, I think, uh, gets the uh, award for the longest lasting planner on, and engineer on the program over 13 years. Um, so it really is um, well known by the team and we really do want to engage with you on any specific questions at this very important time, which um, the team has been working toward for a number of years. Um, so the release of an environmental document is definitely an important milestone for the program and one where we want to be actively engaged with you um, to make sure the information is understood. Um, I want to emphasize again that the comments that you have provided us today are uh, not part of the formal public comments uh, that we would love for you to record in one of those other methods that I outlined for you. Um, today's session has been informational and I hope helpful to you um, to understand what the project is, how to obtain the various documents and receive more information through our website, and of course, how to provide your formal comment on the project. Um, we are very pleased to be able to extend the public comment period in an additional time period. So again, please mark your calendars uh, for Friday, July 31st um, as the end date um, to submit a formal public comment. Um, we will be continuing our public noticing to you um, about the public hearing um, coming up on July 8th. And before then, um, our telephone town hall, which is another session to, um, and to engage folks um, about the project, doing as much as possible as we can, uh, especially during this virtual time uh, where we're not able to meet with you in person. Um, so we really want to be um, as proactive as possible providing you information. So you see the dates here, Monday, June 29th, um, from six to seven will be our telephone town hall. All you have to do is call in. Um, and then our formal public hearing that following week on Wednesday, July 8th. Um, and that will be for the four hour period of three to eight o'clock. So schedule your time, um, follow up with us on any specific questions um, following today's session or scheduling an appointment with the team. Again, they would be happy um, to engage with you or any other requests that you might have during this time. Looks like we have about five more minutes um, before our session will end. So does anyone have any other questions or comments? Um, from my look of things, we have completed um, making sure that we addressed all of our raised hands and all of our chats. Um, so we will stay online till 7.30. So if I can ask our panelists just to sit tight in case we get any latecomers. Sometimes that happens in our public meetings where folks come at the very end, but we are here to serve you and really have um, appreciated you taking the time tonight to receive information about the project. Um, I will sit tight for a moment and see if we get anyone else. Um, and if it's okay, um, I will just go back to our website um, and leave that on the screen as we are getting ready to adjourn. Um, again, um, this is how our public meeting would be organized if we were in person by station. So if you go on any one of these um, stations, Let's do this one. You will get that baseline information about um, that station topic. And if you navigate down um, the associated documents that are part of this station, you would be able to click on them here. So in this case, it's our fact sheet. If you don't already have this, um, this is a great resource for you to have just as a, again, a quick snapshot. Um, we also have a user guide, um, that crazy volume three um, engineering set. Um, there is an engineering, there's a user guide that we put together to help you navigate um, those engineering drawings. For those of us who are not engineers, you might need something like this. Um, so um, this is a good document or a good tool for you to open um, and just kind of using the numbers, kind of walk through and understand how to navigate um, the preliminary engineering uh, volume three section. Um, this is a pretty simple to use document. It's a two page document that shows you screenshots of the document um, so that you know how to navigate. Um, this is available to you and you can down, uh, download or, or print that out as well. So each of these stations has um, this section at the bottom 
where you can um, get the pertinent documents that are associated with that section, with that station. So you can get the documents. And then in some cases, we also offer videos um, to kind of walk you through what you would be experienced if you were in person with us in front of us at that station. So um, as with every website, there's lots of information and um, multiple ways for you to get the same information from different locations on the website. Um, the project team created this specifically so that it would be easy to use, very clickable. Um, so please navigate and check it out. Um, this is our um, station seven, which gives a kind of the big picture overview of real other projects and more about the California high-speed rail system. Um, again, you'll see the documents that are per pertinent to this um, station included down here. So you can um, get more information. This is the regular set of fact sheets that the authority offers to all of our public members of the public um, along various topics. So whether it's noise, business, um, the jobs question, how the authority, how the high-speed rail program is good for the environment, et cetera. There's lots of information to share with you here so you can navigate that on your own. Um, and here in station seven as well, there is a, a video um, that you can uh, walk through um, and understand more about high-speed rail as a technology and how it's being proposed here in California. All right, so again, um, I would like to encourage you to um, comment on the project, stay involved. Um, we very much appreciate your time with us tonight. Um, please uh, stay in touch with us and follow up if you have any additional questions to help you receive information about the project. Otherwise, have a terrific evening and thank you so much for being um, part of our ongoing program to present and bring high-speed rail to Southern California. Thank you so much.